Well, now then, we turn to this, the scriptures this evening, to Luke's Gospel and to chapter 24. The Gospel is recorded by Luke and chapter 24. And we're going to be, begin reading at verse 36. Luke 24 is Luke's account of the resurrection. It's quite brief. Uh, but he goes on to tell us of some characters who met with Christ. They didn't recognize him. And uh, he, on the way to Emmaus, unfolds to them the scriptures. And they themselves then go and meet with others. And this is where verse 36 uh, takes up the story, when they told the things that they had heard of Christ in the way, not knowing him. And as they thus spake, verse 36, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands on my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. When he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was wet yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And he are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. I wonder will you turn with me to the Old Testament scriptures and to the book of Numbers and we read in chapter 6 some verses at the end of Numbers Chapter 6, the fourth book in the Bible, in case you are not familiar with the scriptures, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, then in the book of Numbers, and we read in chapter 6, and we begin reading at verse 22. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his son, saying, On this wise he shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. I'm sure each and every one of us this evening has the memory of somebody's last words to us. It may be somebody that uh, is no longer with us. It may be somebody that we haven't seen for an awful long time, but something that they said to us has stuck with us, and we have never, ever forgotten it. I will remember in 1973 being told by the then minister of this congregation that when I went to Edinburgh to study, I should go to Holyrood Abbey every Sabbath day. And I went in obedience to his command. And the first Sunday I was there, I wondered where on earth he had sent me. Because they baptized an infant, something I'd never seen before. I'd heard of it, I didn't have a clue. But at the end of the service, they sang the paraphrase of these words, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, and so on and so forth. And that memory has stuck with me because under the ministry of Mr. Philip there, I learned an awful lot. But all of us 
have got memories of somebody or another and something that they've said to us. Now, what is happening here in this sixth chapter of the book of Numbers is that very truth. Because these are words that the priests were told they must specifically say at the end of a service. There are a number of other things that obviously were involved in the service, uh, which we continue in our present day and age in the form of worship uh, that we practice. And of course, when we practice our worship, we use words. And th those words are words of hymns. They are words from the reading of the scripture. They are words that we use in prayer. And they are words that the preacher uses as he seeks to expound the scriptures to the congregation. And all of those words of scripture and the words that they pronounce at the end are, of course, the words of God. But other words that are used to communicate the message of the gospel can be tainted with error. I know only too well that I'm not perfect. And neither are you. Neither will any of us be this side of eternity. But language is an important part of our service. But the priest was told that at the very end of the service... What he was to do was to recite these words to the congregation. In other words, as they separated, as they left, and as they went back into the world, into the everyday affairs of life, this was something that would remain with them. These were words that would ring true in their hearts and in their minds for the days that were before them. And we ourselves, in our practice of worship, continue at the end of a service to use words of benediction. We sometimes use the language of the great Apostle Paul when he wrote to the Corinthian church at the end of the second epistle. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Or we use sometimes the words of Jude at the end of that brief epistle of his, and to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy to the only wise God our Saviour, glory, dominion, majesty and power both now and forevermore and those words ring they, they, they strike a chord with us as we think of what God is saying to us in these words now here the priests were told this is what you are to say at the end of a service and the reason surely why they were told to say these things was quite simply this because in specifying these words God was saying to his people something he wants them to know, something he wants them to hear, something he wants to reassure them with. What his desires for his people really are. And his desire for his people is this, to bless us. Now, exactly what do we mean when we use that word? Because, you know, it is a word that very often is used very, very cheaply. You can sometimes come to the end of a, of a program on the radio or the television or some other, and somebody who is a completely godless person will at the end say, good night and God bless you all. And to them, it is a light-hearted sentiment. There is no real significance. They have no concept whatsoever as to exactly what it, what it means for us to know the blessing of God upon us. We use it in, in, in other senses, do we not? Um, I'm sure all you men who are married here tonight uh, followed the tradition that I followed when I decided I want to marry the girl I was going out with. I went to her father and I said to him, will you give us your blessing in order that we might be married? We use it in, in that sense. And we always imagine that the word blessing means goodness. But that isn't always the case. We imagine it to mean good, but that is not necessarily our portion because if you read the story of the scriptures and some of the great characters of the bible and you read the subsequent history of the christian church you will find that the, there are many men and there are many women under god who have known the blessing of god in a very strange way it's summarized for us perhaps best of all in the language of job when he said shall we not receive good and shall we not also receive evil at the hands of god there are many Christian men and there are many Christian women tonight, my friends, and you might have experienced it for yourself, who've suffered great loss. They've gone through great illnesses. They've experienced great poverty. And there are questions that automatically arise in the hearts and in the minds of many uh, Christian people. 
I was preaching recently from the 77th Psalm. And there in that Psalm, he pours out his heart in, in, in complaint to God, in questioning God. He says, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercy? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? He's asking questions because of the circumstances in which he finds himself. You remember the lament of the psalmist when he reflected upon the children of Israel in Babylon. He says, how, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, Psalm 137? Because they were under severe oppression. And to bring it to the very present day and age in which you and I are living in, my, my friends, are we honestly, let's be honest with ourselves, are we honestly able to say tonight that as the church of Jesus Christ, we are enjoying the blessing of God upon us? We have a reasonably healthy congregation here tonight. It's not the case in other places that I go to preach in different parts. And, and the church of Jesus Christ is, is in a struggling situation. The few are getting fewer. The congregations are diminishing. The churches, the chapels are closing down. And we read our great history books. I'm sure there'll be some out there which uh, Mr. Davis has encouraged you to go and look at and, and possibly buy. And if you read the history of the Christian church, we, we long to know something of what our fathers knew. And it seems as far off as ever. And yet, in the midst of it all, God says to his people, before you depart, this is what I want you to remember. I'll bless you. We live in a day, we live in an age, when uh, what we call good is considered evil and when what we consider evil is considered good the moral decline in our nation our hearts are grieved when we speak out when the great debates and the votes are going on in parliament and one thing or another and 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 we voice our concerns in the in the various ways in which we're able to do it today we are considered outdated we are we are we are castigated we are ridiculed because we seek to adhere to the teachings of the scripture but we're also conscious of the fact of our own frailties and of our own weakness. And then we wonder what the future holds for us. How are we going to manage in our old age and one thing and another? But God says to us, listen, before you go, I want you to remember something. I'll bless you. Whatever the situation is, he wants us to know that he will bless us on our way, regardless of what the situation is regardless uh, what the circumstance what regardless of how strange his providence might seem towards us and the way in which he blesses us is manifested here for us in three ways he says first of all the lord blesses thee by keeping thee the lord bless thee and keep thee now by that he means quite simply this whatever our situation is God takes care of us he watches over us he guards us he protects us as a father pitieth his children so the Lord pitieth them that knew him now look at the very situation in which these people found themselves they were in a wilderness and you can imagine the situation in a wilderness the heat of the sun by day the coldness of the night the animals, the wild animals, the, the sense of fear and dread as to what exactly is around the corner, not knowing where their next meal would come from in one respect, not knowing where the water was going to come from, being sustained. Now God says to these people, listen, in this difficult situation, as we come to the conclusion of our service, remember this, I'll keep you. I'll keep you, regardless of what the situation may be. Of course, Moses had a, a tremendous responsibility in seeking to encourage these people because we know only too well from the accounts that are given to us in these books of Moses how it was that they wanted to wander away from God and how they wanted to follow their own devices and their own gods, the golden calf, and so on and so forth, and how they complained to Moses. But his ministry to them was this at the end of the service, listen, God will keep you. They were tempted to compromise. No, no, he says, God will keep you. They needed to be kept because of the weakness. He said, I'll keep you. They knew their frailty towards sin. God says, I'll keep you. That's why I read to you at the very outset that wonderful 
121st Psalm, one of the Psalms of Ascent, as the, the children of Israel made their way to Jerusalem, they sung the Psalms, 121 through to 130. They lifted up their eyes as they saw the hills in the distance. The God of the hills was the God that they were coming to worship. What did he say to them there? He slumbers not nor sleeps. He that keepeth Israel slumbers not nor sleeps. The Lord is thy shade. The Lord is thy defence upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. My friends, God says to us that regardless of the situation in which the church of Jesus Christ and you as individual Christian men and Christian women find yourself tonight, he says, in every condition, in every circumstance, in every trial, I'll bless you because I'll keep you. It'll be a mystery to us on many occasions, but nevertheless, he will keep us. He's begun a good work in us, and he will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter, you remember, those dear people scattered abroad throughout those various regions that he mentions at the outset of his epistle. They were suffering tremendous persecution. And he seeks to minister to them and encourage them, in encouraging them in the things of the gospel. And what does he say to them in verse 5 of chapter 1? He says, you're kept by the power of God unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Those words I quoted you earlier from Jude chapter 24. He is able to keep us from falling. Now my friends, I don't know what your issue is tonight. I don't know what your situation is. But regardless of what it is, listen, this is what God says to you. He will keep you. You remember how it was that in those early chapters of the first book of Samuel, that pillar was raised in commemoration of the goodness of God to his people. And it was called Ebenezer. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. I don't know if there's a book out there about John Knox. But if there is, buy it. Great man. And on one occasion, Mr. Knox was in the presence of Mary, Queen of Scots. And with her usual ferocity, she was threatening him as he preached the gospel and as he told her of the God with whom he had to do. And as, he, as, as she threatened him, this is what he turned around and said to her, Your Majesty, my life is in the custody of him whose glory I seek. Your Majesty, my life is in the custody of him whose glory I seek. Is there any safer place than the custody suite of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ himself? And so he says to these people that he is the God that blesses them in that he keeps them. But then... In the second place, he says something else to them. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. He now says to these people that not only will he keep them, but towards them he will be gracious. Now, there are a number of occasions in the book of Psalms where this phrase appears, and you can look them up for yourself, but particularly in the 80th Psalm, the, fr the phrase appears on three separate occasions, and this is what it says on each occasion. Turn us again, O Lord of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. In the Psalm 119, he puts it like this in verse 135. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. Now what does this mean? The face of God shining upon his people. Well, uh, my grandchildren came to my mother's 90th birthday party uh, yesterday afternoon. And they come and stay with us every other weekend. And last weekend when they were with us, they were going through all the events of the year. And this is what they said. Now, Grandpa, after bonfire night, the next big event is Christmas. But of course, bonfire night went. And it was now Saturday. It was yesterday. They came to me. You know what's next now, don't you? And you could see their faces lighting up with excitement. You know exactly what I mean. If you've got small children or grandchildren or whatever. The excitement. It's as if their faces are shining with a thrill and with a prospect of what it is that Christmas might bring for them. Uh, and we know, do we not, that we often speak of a wedding ceremony and how it is that the, the face of the bride shines 
or so we tell them anyway. I remember one minister saying to me on one occasion he was conducting a, a, a wedding and he, he was going through the words, do you take this man to be your lawful? And he didn't finish and he said, oh yes, please. <laughs> Couldn't wait. You know what we mean? Well, there is a sense of that here. God's face shining upon his people. It means that with favour and delight he looks upon them. Now, have you ever thought how that could possibly be so? Because we read in the scriptures of occasions when the face of God was shining upon his son. There are two occasions in the New Testament. They're both in St. Matthew's Gospel. And the first is in chapter 3 when you remember the Lord Jesus Christ is being baptised. And he is there with John the Baptist. And this is what we read in, in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, at verse 16 uh, Jesus when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well placed the lightning upon him demonstrating the favour of God towards him and then upon the mount of transfiguration in Matthew's gospel again and in chapter 17, this is what we read in verse 5. While he yet spake, Moses and Elijah, Peter, James and John, while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud. You see the shining face of God in the form of a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear he him. And you remember how Peter recounts that in his, in his first epistle. We were with him there in the holy mount, he said. And we heard a voice from the most excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We were eyewitnesses, he said, of his majesty. In other words, the shining favour of God upon his son. Now we can understand that. It's perfectly natural for him to speak with language like that and for pictures to be painted to us like that of Christ, of God's favour upon his only begotten son who had come from his own bosom into this scene of time who was daily his delight continually before him in eternity past this glorious and blessed second person of the Trinity there is no wonder that the face of God shined favourably towards his only begotten son but Moses says here, when you part, remember this, that God himself causes his face to shine upon you in the same manner as it shined upon his son when he sojourned here amongst us. Now how can that be? How can it possibly be that rebellious sinners could know something of the favour of the shine of God upon them? when what they are truly deserving of is his displeasure and of his wrath. It is unnatural for him to shine his face upon us because he's holy. He cannot, he cannot tolerate sin. He cannot, says the prophet, he cannot at all acquit the wicked. He must condemn guilty sinners. He has no option. He's bound by his own law. And if he reverses that, then he, he contradicts himself. But here is the marvel of the gospel of Jesus Christ that God nevertheless has been able to shine his face upon us. How? Through this great word grace. And that's why, the, that's why Moses here says, uh, or God says through Moses, that he is gracious towards us. We need grace. And what we, what we need is what we've been given. He has been gracious towards us. We have tasted and we have seen, to quote again the language of the Apostle Peter, we have tasted and seen that the Lord is gracious. How has he been gracious to us? He's been gracious because on the cross his face no longer shone upon his son. When he was made sin for us, when he became the curse us when all the vials and the anger and the terrors of law and of God were meted out on him at Calvary 
there was a man stood in this pulpit back on Easter Monday and I was sat back in the corner there and I thought I was having a foretaste of heaven. And he wrote a book, written many books, but in one of the books he turns this around, what we are looking at in Numbers chapter 6. And Sinclair B. Ferguson says this, The Lord curse you and forsake you. The Lord make his face frown upon you and condemn you. The Lord turn his face away from you and give you grief. And he says to us tonight, he's gracious because that is what he did to his only son. He allowed him, he caused him to suffer the anger of God in order that you and I might enjoy the favour of God. The darkness of God's frown was meted out on him that we might know the brightness of of the smile and of the favour of God towards us. God's face was turned away from his son in order that it might be turned towards us. You remember that great lament of the Saviour upon the cross of Calvary. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That which had existed from all eternity was severed communion between the Father and the Son when the dark night of sin fell upon the Son of the living God. And the biblical word for that is grace. God's great love, God's great goodness, God's great kindness to people who deserve the complete opposite. And that's why here in the Old Testament language we are told that the Lord causes his face to shine upon us in that he is gracious towards us. My dear friends, do you oftentimes think, and you cannot but help notice this as you read your Bibles, the great lengths that God has gone to to save sinners you read, you read, for example, the intricacy of the arguments of the great apostle. How he wheels in uh, the case, for example, in the epistle of the Romans, of the case for the prosecution in those opening chapters. And how God condemns sinners and yet, miraculously, through the propitiated sacrifice of Christ, he is able to justify sinners. He's going to great lengths to explain to us what God has done and what God was prepared to do. And the, the, the outcome of that argument surely is this. If he's gone to such great lengths to save us, he's going to keep us. And he's going to continue to protect us. And he's going to continue to provide for us. And he's going to continue to sustain us. And he's going ultimately to bring us safely to our desired haven. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. My friend, can I ask you tonight, do you know something of that in your soul? Do you know something of what it is to experience this glorious grace of God turning you from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and to know something of the preciousness of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ? But then he tells us a third thing. He says, the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. And then he says, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Now the word in, in our English language here uh, for his countenance is exactly the same word in the previous verse that has been translated face. In other words, the Lord make his countenance or his face to shine upon you. In other words, the gaze of God is fixed upon you. He doesn't turn his back on us, but with favour, he continuously looks upon us. And the consequence of that now is not grace, but peace. Now, we are living uh, on the 8th of February this year, on the day when we as a nation remember the sacrifice of of so many in, in times of war. And we know that we have lived in relative peace 
in recent times. There have been conflicts, we know, but compared to what was happening in the First World War and the Second World War, we are living in relative peace. What is peace? Peace is the absence of war. And man in sin is at war with God. He's an enemy of God. But what God does in the gospel graciously is this. He secures peace for us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And never ever confuse that with the peace of God. It's completely different. The peace with God is the consequence of our justification. The peace of God is the consequence of the outworking of the, of the work of grace in our hearts and in our lives. There is a wonderful phrase in the book of Genesis to do with the story of Joseph. And in chapter 43 of the book of Genesis, and in verse 27, you remember that Joseph uh, had, had, had inquired about his father. His brothers didn't have a clue who he was. And they returned to Egypt. And the first question that he puts to his brothers, the old man of whom you speak, is there shalom? Is there peace at home? Is all well at home, is what he was asking. And that's the word that is, is, is in the mind of, of Moses as, as, as he's writing uh, the, these words and in the heart of God as he, as he gives them unto his servant Moses. He's enjoying perfect peace with God. Everything that's good of God. Matthew Henry puts it like this. All that good which goes to make up complete happiness. That's what is being dispensed for us here. The Lord is being gracious unto us and he's lifting up the light of his countenance upon us and he's given us peace, quiet contentedness and satisfaction. You know, we, we live in a world that is so contrary to the world that we as Christian men and Christian women enjoy. The world has gone mad, my friends. There is no other explanation for it. Uh, you remember how Isaiah put it at the end of chapter 57. The wicked are like the troubled sea, which cast up mire and dirt because it cannot rest. And uh, you, you'll go out tomorrow morning to the workplace or to the, wherever it is that you are doing your business and shopping and one thing or another, and you'll hear people speak and you'll watch the news broadcast and you're conscious of the fact as a Christian, as you look on this world, what you see is a world that's completely at ill ease with itself. It's uneasy about everything and yet in the midst of such a world as that with all its trials and troubles and tribulations this restless world for the child of God there is quiet contemplation of the knowledge that they are at peace because with pity the Christian looks upon this world as it strives to find its fix and they'll never ever find it they say to me on a Friday afternoon, are you sure now, Steve, we don't want to put a pound down for the lottery? Because if we win, we won't be here Monday morning. And my answer to them, you'll still be poorer than me. And they will. You can't put a price on this. This is beyond price. Come without money and buy the peace of God. The keeping power of God. I read in the newspaper not too very long ago some woman that had come to a divorce settlement with her husband and she was going to wonder how she was going to manage to live on £10,000 a week. How on earth is she going to manage on £10,000 a week? I know people, my friend, don't even know, not a year. Can you see the discontent that that speaks about? The vanity of all that this world has to offer to us? And what is the Christian? He's somebody who is under the shining face of God. And he knows something of the peace of God. Which passes all understanding. Now then. That is the benediction that. Was ministered by the priest. And that's the thing that we need to notice in verse 27. Because there we are told that the only way in which this could be ministered was by a priest. Look at verses 22 and verse 23. The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron. Who was Aaron? He was the high priest. And say to him, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel. You see, this 
text here, these verses here in Numbers chapter 6, are pointing us forward to another priest, the great high priest of the church of Jesus Christ. These people were being reminded of the simple truth they couldn't come to God by themselves. They needed a mediator. They needed sacrifices to be offered. And at the end of the sacrificial offering, the priest said to them, now go on your way, and the Lord bless thee and keep thee, and so on and so forth. What was it prefiguring? It was prefiguring the great high priest our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. How do we enjoy this blessing today? There's only one way, and that's through Christ. He says to us, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is none other name, was the preaching of the early church. There is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we might be saved other than that which is given, which is Jesus Christ. There's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The only means by which men and women can come to God is through this priest, who is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the Acts of the Apostles and in chapter 3, we read some remarkable words. From Genesis 12 on, you remember that God makes a promise through Abram that in him all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And this uh, that we are considering together here this evening are, are some of the um, aspects of that blessing upon us. But it's a, an interesting verse in the third chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. You remember that Peter uh, and, and John have healed this lame man and they, they won't take any credit for it. They say it's of God and they begin to preach to the people and explain to them exactly something of what has happened. And he says here in, in Acts chapter 3 and in verse 25, you are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers unto Abram. And in thy seed shall all the kingdoms of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. In other words, the blessing that is spoken about here, the blessing that was promised to the patriarch Abram is the blessing that finds its fulfillment in none other than our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And he is the one who is being prefigured, who is being pointed to you as the one who blesses his people. He communicates grace to them. He communicates peace to them. He keeps them. Oh, what those words must have meant to those disciples when in the, in the parable of the good shepherd he says to them I give to them eternal life they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand or imagine being in his presence in John chapter 17 hey father I will that those whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they might behold my glory. What's he saying? He's going to keep us. He's going to give to us his peace. My peace I leave with you. He's going to communicate his grace towards us. Remember that great verse in, in Paul's writing to the Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. Paul speaks times without number about the riches of the grace of God. And that which is prefigured here finds its ultimate fulfillment in the person and in the work of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now you might be asking yourself tonight the question, why did the preacher read from Luke chapter 24? Well, there is such a thing, you know, as a preacher's license. Jesus comes to the end of his journey here upon earth. He takes these people to Bethany. And he's going back to heaven. But before he goes, he raises his hands. And he blesses them. What did he say? I'll tell you what I believe he said. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Because he's the great high priest who has authority to pronounce this blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. Be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee. And give thee peace. 
The mediation of this blessing comes through none other than our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The final thing I want to point out to you this evening is quite simply this. This is something that God wants to give his people. You notice what we are told at the end of verse 27. And I will bless them. I will bless them. With confidence, we can look at these words that were pronounced every day upon the people of God, knowing in full measure that they're not empty words. They're not words of false expectation, but they are the words of the living God. These people were under a covenant, we are under a better covenant. And that better covenant provides greater things than that which went on before. Now that doesn't mean, my friends, to you and me, that all will be plain sailing and everything in the garden will be rosy. But in the midst of it, what God says to us is this, he keeps us. He's gracious to us. He gives to us his peace. Why? Because he's put his name on us and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel in other words see these people they belong to me do you know a few years ago my two sons were stumped as to what they would buy me for Christmas so they bought me a personalised number for my car and a few weeks later they said dad the bill has come and we haven't got no money will you bail us out so I had to pay for it myself. I never had the money back. But you know, if you look at my car, it's Jav, my son's cynical ideas. But you know what it says? It's mine. And nobody can have it. It's mine. Do you know what God says as he looks upon you? They're mine. Nobody else is having them. He's put his name upon us. You remember that great prayer? If my people which are called by my name. The stamp of God is upon us. He has sealed us for himself. And his longing and his desire for us is to conform us to the image of his son. And he enables us to progress in the life of grace because he keeps us. He's gracious to us. He gives to us his peace. And whatever our situation is. Whatever the circumstance might be, we know not what the future brings. But in the midst of it all, in the church of Jesus Christ, we are sure of this fact. He'll bless us. He'll keep us. He'll be gracious towards us. And he'll continue to give us his peace. If that is not cause to give thanks to God tonight, I don't know what on earth is. But thanks be to God that he has pronounced his blessing upon us. And he has given to us so graciously in his mercy and loving kindness the Saviour to dispense and to minister these great things to us in the, every, in the everyday affairs of our life's journey. May it be to us tonight the word of God. Well, we're going to sing our final hymn which captures something of these sentiments. 574. 574. How firm a foundation Ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, you who unto Jesus for refuge have fled, the soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavour to shake, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. 574.
Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.